This is Quinn Zera, Executive Director of APSIA. I'm delighted you could join us today for a, another webinar in our continuing series on different career options. This one looking at options and careers at the U.S. Department of Labor. We're pleased that the Robertson Foundation for Government inspired us to reach out to Josh and ask him to give this presentation. And he's going to talk a little bit about what he's seeing at the department, uh, the kinds of things and opportunities that might be available to your students, and then we'll take any questions that you might have. As you go through, as we go through, please feel free to put any questions in that chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And we'll take them either as we go, if they're immediate, or at the end, uh, once Josh has had a chance to finish speaking. The webinar will be recorded and available afterwards, as well as a summary of mine as soon as I can get it done. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Josh. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? All right, so uh, thanks for the time. My name is Josh Kagan. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Trade and Labor Affairs here in the U.S. Department of Labor's Bureau of International Labor Affairs. So uh, my expertise really is only going to apply to the Bureau of International Labor Affairs. So we're the, the part of the Department of Labor that focuses on international labor issues. I can you know, speak a little bit about the department's domestic work, but uh, I'm not nearly as knowledgeable about that. So ILAB, the Bureau of International Labor Affairs, we, we have about 125 people that work here out of a massive federal department that primarily focuses on domestic issues. So we like to think of ourselves as small but mighty. Um, we have within ILAB, uh, again, ILAB Bureau of International Labor Affairs, within ILAB we have four uh, functional offices. There is an office uh, that focuses exclusively on child labor, forced labor, and human trafficking issues. Uh, so we call them OCFT, uh, C for child, F for forced labor, T for trafficking. They're, they're our largest office, uh, and they, I would, they do a number of things, but I would say the two biggest things they do is they fund uh, grants, technical assistance projects around the world that help to reduce incidences of forced labor, human trafficking, and the worst forms of child labor. Um, then they also have a research shop that puts out two annual reports. One uh, is what we call the TDA, Tra uh, Trade and Development Act, or the worst forms of child labor report that basically looks at uh, country practices on a pretty in-depth level and how those countries are doing a good job or falling short on uh, addressing the worst forms of child labor, often through their enforcement mechanisms. And then they put out a report, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act report, or using my, my government vernacular, TVPRA. Uh, and that report focuses more on just supply chain sectors, supply chain issues and sectors. And so it, it's just a list of goods that are imported into the United States from around the world that we have reason to believe are produced uh, with child labor, forced labor, or both. So that, that office puts out those reports and funds those projects. Um, and they, I would, I'm going to estimate their staff is probably about 45 to 50 people. Uh, then there is an office of international relations. Uh, there are probably about 20 people and they they're the lead for the U S government in Represent, representing us in multilateral and bilateral international organizations and groups that focus on labor issues. So uh, the International Labor Organization is the big one, the ILO, but they also represent us on labor equities in the G20, the G7, um, the various regional groups like ASEAN for Southeast Asia uh, or the uh, OAS for the Western Hemisphere. And so they work on kind of a lot of bigger picture labor issues generally focused on raising labor standards around the world. Uh, then there is an office that, that's probably five or six people. It's, it's rather small that focuses exclusively on economic and labor research issues. Uh, so that's the Office of Economic and Labor Research, OELR. They, uh, they put out a variety of their own research or publications that capture their own research 
and they also uh, kind of curate and manage projects where research is done by other people. They do a lot of lit reviews. So their, their job is, is in general supporting our policy engagement, to some extent our project engagement, uh, and making sure that it's, it's based on a, a well-founded uh, set of facts and understanding of the issues. And then my office uh, is the Office of Trade and Labor Affairs. Uh, we work around the world on the nexus of those two issues, trade and labor. So in general, we are using U.S. Uh, trade policy, U.S. trade agenda to uh, advance labor issues, raise labor standards around the world, and ensure that countries are complying, our trade partners are complying with their labor commitments to the U.S. So we have multiple divisions in the office. We have a division that works kind of on the front end of negotiating trade agreements, making sure that uh, whatever trade agreements we sign have robust labor labor requirements for our trade partners. And so obviously those folks are focused significantly on the NAFTA renegotiation right now and recently on Korea as well. They also work on monitoring and enforcing the labor requirements of U.S. trade preference programs, which are basically of one-sided trade agreements. We, we agree, they're principally with developing countries. And so we agree to lower our tariffs uh, if countries will meet certain kind of best practice standards, one of which is ensuring compliance with international labor standards. So we have a team that makes sure that that's happening with respect to uh, Haiti under the HOPE2 program, uh, most of Sub-Saharan Africa under the AGOA program, and then the, uh, the TSP program around the world, um, I'm sorry, the GSP program around the world, General System of Preferences, um, that covers really most developing countries in the world. Uh, then we have a team that focuses exclusively on U.S. free trade agreements. There are 20, we have 20 FTA partners, 19 of those contain labor requirements. So we're basically saying if you're going to get these lower tariffs, these trade access benefits, you have to comply with certain labor requirements. The FTA requirements are much more stringent, uh, generally require a country to effectively enforce its labor laws and to uh, adopt and maintain laws that comply with international labor standards defined by the ILO. So we have a team that focuses very in depth on those countries doing monitoring work so they know exactly what's happening in our trade partner country, our trade partners. And um, then we have a kind of an enforcement tool that either can be initiated by us or by outside parties that is called the submission process. Basically, anyone can file a complaint with us saying, hey, country X is not living up to its commitments, its labor commitments to the U.S. under a free trade agreement. And then we do a review where we go to the country, we talk to the government, we talk to workers, we talk to private sector, and we come up with a report uh, that basically will either say, things are fine, let's move on, uh, that's option one. Option two, there's significant issues, let's try and find a collaborative way to work through them, and help our partner out, uh, that's option two. Option three, things are really egregious, we think they're clearly in violation of the trade agreement, and then we can move to a arbitration process. So that team kind of does a lot of our monitoring and enforcement work, and then we have a team in the office that we also have a grant shop. So our philosophy is, and I laid it out there just very quickly and briefly, but um, sometimes there's no real issues. Sometimes it's an enforcement type situation, but sometimes we think we can work collaboratively with another country to improve labor issues in that country, respect for labor rights in that country. And so we have uh, a grants shop that helps to support governments. When we think there's political will to actually make improvements, we help to support them in, in doing just that. So we try to use all those pieces kind of together to have a cohesive coordinated strategy for each country so that we are uh, advancing compliance with the labor provisions of our trade agreements or preference programs. The, um, you know, so a question I often get is how has the work changed in, with this administration compared to past ones? You know, there's obviously different levels of um, priority given to our parts of our budget by any administration across history. Uh, but, but this administration clearly is focused a lot more on what does it mean for American workers? And that's something that we think we really speak to uh, is, you know, it, it's so what I described, yeah, it's raising labor standards in other countries, but it also benefits American workers in a globalized economy 
where you know we don't want our workers in the U.S. to be competing with you know people in forced labor or kids or people laboring in sweatshops for you know 23, 24 hours a day. We want everyone to to be uh, we don't want to be a race to the bottom. We want to be a race to the top. We want everyone to be competing on a level playing field. So our work not only is helping to raise labor standards in other countries, we believe it's also helping American workers compete on a fair fair playing field. So that's a very quick overview of kind of who we are, what the Bureau of National Labor Affairs does. We engage, you know, we, we travel a lot. Uh, we are constantly engaging with U.S. embassies overseas, foreign governments, both overseas and in their missions here in the U.S., international organizations, workers groups, employers groups, and, um, you know, kind of the whole gamut. And we we work very closely, I, my office in particular, we work very closely with the State Department and with USTR, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative of the White House. Um, so I, I guess, you know, any questions, maybe if you want to just send them along or send them, send them to the end, that's fine. I, th I think probably of interest for this group, you know, how, how did how did folks get here? Where are people come from? Uh, it varies. I mean, certainly mo most, if not all, people that work here have international backgrounds. We have a lot of folks with international development backgrounds, especially people who work on our, our grants. A number of people worked for past grantees or nonprofits that work on uh, kind of labor related issues or children's rights related issues, or just development in general. We prioritize language skills. Um, not everyone, you know, certainly people who cover kind of global portfolios and who couldn't possibly know every language. But for example, the team that covers US free trade agreements that I described, the bulk of those trade agreements, I think almost a dozen of them are with Spanish speaking countries. That just happens to be the way that our trade agreements were negotiated. So, so we need people who have the language skills to be able to engage with foreign governments and employers groups and workers groups. Uh, and to review documents and to write emails and messages back to officials in other countries. So the language skills are very important for particular portfolios. Uh, we have we have a number of our PCVs, former Peace Corps volunteers that work here in various capacities. I'm I'm one myself, um, and we have a number of presidential management fellows who work in iLab. Um, I think we probably have about a dozen of those as well. I'm also one of those. Um, and and then I would say our my my office in particular, more than the other offices, we hire a lot of folks with legal backgrounds. It's not a requirement, but um, you know I think for for the folks that do our the reviews of the submissions under trade agreements, that requires analytical skills. We have we have people on that team, including the division chief, who do not have legal backgrounds. They have international relations backgrounds and are phenomenal members of our team. Um, but that's kind of just historically how that has broken down. Um, I would say I, every almost everyone here has a graduate degree. Um, not again, not a requirement, but a lot of international relations folks in general. Um, kind of unique quirk. I don't know that we have really any unique quirks to kind of process right now, but uh, you know, generally across the U.S. government. There was a hiring freeze, so that is not technically still in effect. But the Department of Labor, Department of Labor, Labor still has a waiver process that we go through. So relevant, I think, to this group, only to point out that our, you know, we we hire strictly based on need. It's a lot of backfilling right now, and that um, that is something that we put a lot of time and resources and thought into doing, and uh, kind of. We also tend to keep folks in general. We don't have a lot of turnover. So when we hire, uh, I think it's it's quite notable. We put a lot of time, like I said, into making sure that we get the right people because while we support them wherever they go in their careers, we ideally want them to stay here. So I, you know, I we go through the general USA jobs process, uh, but we also do, like I said, hire PMFs and folks with special hiring authority, uh, like these four volunteers. Um, what it's like to work here. I think, you know, I, I'll speak for my office specifically. It, it's pretty fast paced and it's a lot, you know, we, pe we expect people to kind of develop expertise in the countries that they cover. 
and um, to to kind of really be the U.S. government's lead on labor issues in a particular country. So that require you know that that means desk research. That means getting out and talking to contacts in D.C. That means traveling to the country often for a week or two and getting to know contacts in country. Really just making sure that when questions arise, whether they're within our office or other parts of the government, or quite often in Congress, that that you know our folks are developing the expertise to answer those questions. Uh, I got a question: Is a clearance needed for most positions? Yes. Uh, I think actually I, we have a couple, we have one person that does audits in the Bureau and I think maybe one or two admin folks who do not have clearances, uh, but everyone else has to has to be able to get and maintain a, a secret clearance. Um, and then we have some folks in kind of higher levels of management that have top secret clearances, but yeah, you it, a clearance is needed for most positions. Even, like I said, even most of our admin folks, other than the couple I mentioned, high, uh, handle tables and other sensitive materials so they need that clearance as well. Um, so I that was that was a pretty quick overview, I think. Um, I you know I can go more into depth anything into anything in particular if folks have questions. I didn't want to go too heavy on kind of the the weeds of the substance unless there's interest, but I think it's it's a it's a great place to work. You know, I think we're a lot of people here who really believe in what we do, believe in the mission. Folks tend to stick around here for for a long time. Uh, I think we fill kind of a unique a unique niche in that we are labor issues in general. I would say my office in particular are kind of at the nexus of trade and labor issues. You hear more and more uh, consumers that care about uh, labor issues and fair treatment issues and social equity issues, and you hear you know more and more countries are focusing on labor issues in their trade agenda. We were the first. United States, the first country to require compliance with labor standards in our trade agreements. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about doing it in Europe and in other places right now. So I think it's an area of a lot of interest to a lot of folks. Um, and it's frankly, it's, it's, it's a bipartisan issue right now in terms of tying it back to American workers. So I think it's an exciting place to work. It's, it's a growing area and uh, we're, you know, we enjoy working here. So I don't know if there's any other questions or if folks you know, want me to speak about anything in particular, I'm happy to do it. But those are kind of the, the general points I wanted to, to cover. Josh, this is Carmen. Thank you so much for that. Um, while my colleagues are typing, what I'm sure are there questions about things, uh, I had a couple. Um, you talked about how many of your colleagues have graduate degrees. Yeah. Are they typically focused on a particular Area? Are they typically focused on, on labor rights itself? Are they focused on business or supply chain management? What are the common backgrounds into the field, into the work? It really varies. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of ran through it quick, but we have a variety, you know, we, we do a variety of different things with respect to kind of international labor issues more broadly. So I, I would say everything you just named the answer would be yes. Depending on the particular position, any of those would be relevant. You know, honestly, there aren't a lot slash any programs that I know of that focus exclusively on international labor issues, maybe Cornell. Um, but I think in general, I guess I would say for, for my office, people generally come at it from either a broad international relations and international affairs background. That could mean just education. That could mean they've They've worked with international organizations. Uh, it could also mean they have a particular regional focus. The our technical assistance programs, often at least in the child labor force labor office, are broken up by region of the world. So you know, like Spanish might be super helpful to focus on the Latin American team. You know, not really useful for the team that focuses on Southeast Asia. So I think it, uh, particular language skills would make you more marketable for a, a, a certain position. But I think kind of broad based international relations, international affairs backgrounds are also very common. Uh, I mentioned in certain segments, kind of a legal background is, is common, though not a requirement. Um, so I would say the way, I, the way I think of it is kind of, we have international relations folks, we have international human rights folks, we have kind of regionally focused folks, we have people with, a limited number of people with a trade specific background 
and then we have people who have like a domestic labor background. I think any of those, you know, it's a couple steps from any of those to what we do. So that we look at all of those groups, you know, when we're hiring for positions, we, we try to target it and send it out to, to all of those. Um, so I think any of those would be relevant. There's another Just, question yes, available to you right now. Uh, so my office has just, we, we recently uh, hired five positions, which is a lot for us. Um, and that was one on our administrative team and then four for the team that monitors and enforces US trade agreements. So the, the application period for those was closed. Um, but, and I, and I don't envision anything coming out of my office in the immediate future, our child labor, forced labor human trafficking office, I'm not sure that they have any open right now, but they've just recently had some. And I, th I think it would be reasonable to think there would be one or two more coming. So I, I, no, no hot tips there really, other than I think, you know, just maybe checking uh, USA jobs, which is where everything gets posted. Um, I, th I think they're, you know, the federal government has certain timelines we're supposed to adhere to for the hiring process. And it's not, you know, once we get all the applications, there's a lot of internal steps. So the application window for for when people can actually apply is generally pretty short, like two weeks. Um, so I would say, you know, I, the best advice I can give on that is to kind of check USA jobs. You can obviously set reminders, uh, not reminders. You can, you can uh, kind of tailor it so that it will ping you when, you know, you can say, I want to ping me when jobs come up in iLab, for example, and you, it can do that. So it'll let you know right when they go live. But I don't, I don't think we have anything up right now. I might be mistaken because child labor has kind of done them a few one at a time. Um, but I think, you know, there's, I would reasonably project that there might be one or two more coming from that shop. Would you talk briefly about that internal process? What happens once candidates come in? Sure. Um, so you, you mean from when people apply? Yes. So, you know, we, we put out, we put up the announcements. I, we've, we've made a very concerted effort to try and expand the pool of who receives our hiring announcements. So it's not just the folks who happen to have set the reminder in USA jobs or the people we already know, but it's a, it's a wider pool. So, you know, I, I personally, uh, did a lot of research and tried to contact folks at at uh, international relations schools, graduate schools across the country. Uh, we also are committed to diversity and inclusion issues. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing the best we could to reach out to diverse segments of the population. Um, so, and, and maybe not you know, get, get, have people receive our, our ask. So, uh, so that's kind of the step one. Then, like I said, there's about two weeks for folks to apply. Then once that once that period closes, the applications go to our HR office. They do kind of an initial review. There's a scoring system. So kind of one of the I guess pro tips, if you will, for applying for federal jobs in general is you'll see specialized experience sections that will say, you know, in order to fulfill, you know, fill this job, you have to have a certain specialized experience. Across the board, in my experience, the first line of this is someone in the HR office will go through and, and try and say, okay, I might not know exactly what this person, what this job does, but I know it's in the specialized experience and does this application check those boxes. And they come up with a score. So we, we do scoring plans beforehand where we say, you know, I, this thing is really, you know, being able to speak this language is super important to us. This is just an example. Um, this other thing, you know, these quantitative skills are also important to us, but not quite as important. So we'll go through and score everything like this attribute 10 points, this attribute seven points. And so the HR office will really go through and score everybody. And then they will send, uh, they'll have a cutoff point. So let's say scoring goes up to a hunt, can go up to a maximum of a hundred. We'll have predetermined that everyone who gets above a 75 makes it to us. So they'll go through and they'll score them all. They'll send them to us. The first line for us is a person, the designation is a, a SME, subject matter expert. That's generally just someone on the team that's doing the hiring, but not the hiring manager. And so this, the SME will go through and kind of do a little bit of a qualitative review and say, you know, this, 
okay, this person said they have experience in X. Uh, they checked the box saying yes, but when I read their resume, it's not anywhere. So actually, you know, I think they should be downgraded for that answer. And they go through and they just try and it, there's no additional research. There's nothing, they're not supposed to bring any biases into it. It's just literally, are the, are the boxes they checked or the answers that they said yes to, that they got points for, are those actually substantiated from their application materials? And so that generally narrows the pool a little bit. Uh, and, then, and then all of those go to the hiring manager. Um, for, for my team, for my office, we, use, we have a hiring official, but we also have hiring teams. Uh, and so, you know, the, the hiring official, the hiring team will then go through the applicants that made it past the subject matter expert and determine kind of what are the, what are the top folks there. Uh, they'll, they'll figure out how many spots they're hiring for and then how many interviews they should do to make sure that they have a wide pool of candidates to choose from for those spots. And then they will uh, reach, you know, schedule those interviews. And uh, once the interview, our goal is we, we never want to have just one person in an interview. We always try to have at least two, two people from our management team just to get different perspectives. And then re the hiring team will reconvene once all the interviews are done, compare notes, uh, usually whittle the pool down to around where we need it to be. And then that's the time when we are, you know, additional writing samples or reaching out to references. Uh, sometimes our, our, my boss, our office director, not sometimes, often will want to get involved and kind of have a follow-up conversation or a call or a Skype chat or whatever with the person just to get kind of, you know, form his own opinion. And then we get it down to a point where we kind of have a final, final group. Um, and that's, that's who we extend the offers to. The, our HR office sets time periods from when we get the kind of people who are scored, when the people who are scored kind of go to the subject matter expert uh, until when we make our final selections. We have a set period of time for that. It's usually 30 days. Uh, so to get all those like interviews done and materials reviewed is, is you know, it's, it's a lot. Um, obviously depends on the volume. Sometimes we can get that extended but generally they, you know, federal hiring is slow enough as it is. So generally they don't want us to extend it unless it's extenuating circumstances. The, the situation I just mentioned where I had done some outreach and we, uh, you know, I said we were hiring five, one for an admin spot, one for the monitoring and enforcement team. The monitoring enforcement team position, you know, we, we got like 1,100 applications for, for four spots. So um not all of those made it through every step of the process obviously but it was it was a big pool so in that case we got a 30-day extension from hr so we had 60 days total um but it, it still was pretty pretty packed um so it, there's a lot of steps in the process um but i think that i think that's the general overview of how it works so a lot of what i described is not unique to us it's just kind of how the federal hiring process works um but but i think the you know once it gets past the subject matter expert, how we handle it in our office and the hiring teams and things like that and the interviews, I think that's probably our, you know, specific to, to my office. Are there particular ways that we can flag great candidates for you if we know of exceptional students who've applied or alumni? Yeah, I think so. The, the unfortunate thing, well, I guess the unfortunate thing is we don't hire that often. I mean, it depends on your perspective, right? It could be fortunate because it means people like working here. But um, but it's not it's not a place in the federal government in general probably is not a place where you know someone just is a shining star and we really you know we think they'd be a great fit and you think they'd be a great fit and we just don't have a spot I mean we have to get it, it's pretty formalized process in terms of having having funding and hiring authority to hire a new person but what I what I would say is like you know reaching out with folks we we have interns all have uh, people who come here on details from other agencies. We have people on fellowships. I mean, I think that's a really, my perspective, there is no better way to know whether you think a, a particular uh, employment employer would be a good fit. And there's no better way for them to know if they think you're a good fit than to go there and work there. I mean, I, so I, just personal anecdote, I, I started, I was an intern here 
uh, and I went from intern to staff to second level management in six years. So, uh, and, and I, that's, that's, I mean, the, maybe the management part is a little bit unique, but we hire interns all the time. I mean, I think our, our philosophy is, you know, inter, you know, interviews are valuable. And we have writing samples that we usually do as part of our interviews because writing is really important to what we do. Strong writing, but but it's an science. It's an imperfect process. So the best way to know if someone is a good fit is to actually have them have them working here. Now I realize that internships are not always a realistic option for folks. I mean, we unfortunately generally do not have funds to pay interns. Um, not everyone can can just you know not get paid during the day, even on a part time basis. So I, I think kind of the next best thing I would say is, you know, if, if you think great candidates are coming along, we uh, not when we're doing our hiring, but anytime when we're not hiring, I'm happy to do informational interviews. I think a, a number of our managers would be happy to do informational interviews to just kind of give folks a more in-depth sense of what we do and whether they actually think it might be a good fit. And, and, and if that's the case and if people are like, yeah, you know, that sounds like something I would want to do. Then I would say, and, and this is unfortunately not going to be the, the most prompt response, but we, you know, we should have a wide list of people who are interested in our in our kind of work we do, either in an institutional capacity in a, in you know a university or an individual person. And as hiring opportunities open up, or as other opportunities open up, we can make sure that people are on our distribution list and are getting those getting those opportunities and have a fair chance to apply. We had another question of uh, Elizabeth. How can people do details with you? So the we there's a variety of ways. Um, I, I think that we if you're already an employee of another federal agency, uh, there's all kinds of programs to do details. Um, the PMF program is a very formalized one, but there's less formal ones as well. The Department of Labor has a, a very well defined internal detail process. Um, you know, we, we generally, and then I would say for external candidates, fellowships maybe is, is a more direct tool. I'd say internships and fellowships are the tool that we use, two tools that we use the most often. Um, it, the, the problem, which was kind of alluded to earlier, is that folks don't need to have a clearance to uh, start working here. You can start work without a clearance, but your clearance investigation has to be underway, and if it comes back favorable then that's generally an issue but but you have to have at least a, a very general kind of suitability for federal employment review done by our security office so so details kind of with people who are outside the u.s government i think can happen in certain contexts they're generally through like fellowships and internships but but we still have to have that initial suitability done um but but i would say kind of the more direct answer i guess would be you know you can just reach out to us uh, we have kind of evolving needs throughout the year. So interns are, are a tool we often use, but it does not need to be a tool we exclusively use as workflows kind of flare up throughout the year. Like I know our child labor force labor office, when they put out that worst forms of child labor report, that's they do it now on like a jump drive, but they used to do it in print. And it's, I mean, it, it's massive. Um, it's like a doorstop. So that, that requires a lot of people and if, Someone happens to be out on a maternity leave, or someone happens to be on a detail elsewhere, or someone has moved on from the position and they haven't backfilled yet. I mean, they, they have a lot of kind of all hands on deck situations that report out. And we have a number of those kind of situations as well. Like we do an annual review of um, countries' compliance with the labor requirements for Goa in Sub Saharan Africa. We have one person that covers that portfolio. She can't possibly do all of those reviews by herself. So we, and it usually happens in the summer, so we usually bring in folks to help with that. So that doesn't have to be interns, it could be folks on detail, I think. The, the catch is we don't always, we generally don't have funds. Um, so it would have to be someone who can secure outside funding. But, um, but I think in terms of like the work, you know, we, we have plenty of work to go around. And if it's, if it's an opportunity folks would be interested in, I think we could, we could try and find a way to make it work. We've always been so good about sharing opportunities, so uh, keep them coming. I'm, I'm sure our schools are, are happy to see if they can find you good folks. Great. Do you have a sense of about how many PMF 
the office takes each year? It definitely varies. Um, I would say, my so my office historically has t my, my office has probably taken one to three a year. Um, I would say OC at the Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor, Human Trafficking, which is bigger. Uh, they, I'm just going to estimate, they probably take like two to five a year. Um, so it, it just really varies. Actually, the last couple of years have slowed down on the PMF front for, for us. I'm not exactly sure why. I don't, I don't, there certainly has not been any policy shift that I'm aware of, uh, at least on our end. But, um, but I think it, it's definitely something that uh, whenever we hire, we look at kind of we do a USA jobs announcement. And then we also look at the PM, assuming that the timing is appropriate, we look at the PMF pool. Um, so it, it just really kind of varies from year to year. And, you know, some administrations want us to focus on particular parts of our work. So we do more hiring in that area. Sometimes we just happen to have turnover on a particular team. So we do more hiring in that area. So it really varies year to year, um, but I, it's part of our plans. Great. Folks, as, as you know, feel free to type questions in the chat box or else you just have to keep listening to me, which is never <laughs> fun. Um, Josh, I, you talked a little bit about perhaps, and this is my word, reframing how the work that you do fits in with the current priorities of the administration. Mm -hmm. Knowing that they talk a lot about trade, do you see further evolution or new emphases coming into what iLab is doing that might shape and shift who you hire and, and how you're structured? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I can't tell you kind of what's coming down down the pike in that sense, but but I, I can say that, you know, that this administration came in, I mean, trade has always been part of what we do um, and the publicly available the kind of directive to us that was in the original budget was to focus on trade enforcement issues. Um, so that's something that's already our bread and butter. You know, we, we do it directly in my office. It's in the name of the office that we're focused on kind of the nexus between trade and labor issues. But I think our child labor office also has a number of tools that relate to trade enforcement, you know, like the, um, the reports that they put out are identifying kind of countries that are that are lacking in terms of their enforcement, which is directly related to trade payments in the US. Uh, they also do you know, some work on kind of imports into the US, you know, whether they're made with forced labor, that's kind of a research uh, prerogative they contribute to to help make sure that goods that are made with forced labor are not sent to the US. So, you know, I, I, would, I would hesitate to kind of predict what the future holds in terms of prerogatives or priorities for, for any administration really i mean i i don't know what the future holds any better than anyone else does but but i do think that you know there, there's no reason for me to think that that the the emphasis on trade will be any less important going forward i mean we're you know, whether folks want this to be the case or not you know we're part of global economy at this point and so i you know our our view is that you know the the responsible thing to do whether you're focused internally or externally is to try and make sure that that uh, global economy is functioning in a fair way and in a way that is, respects uh, workers' rights and ensures that the playing field is fair and that, you know, workers are not forced to compete against kids and the kids are not forced to work and going to school. And so I, I think that, you know, I, regardless of the administration, regardless of, uh, you know, kind of what's happening in, on the Hill or in the White House, uh, our mission has remained fairly consistent. Um, maybe particular parts of it have become, you know, more, more accentuated or, or bigger focus. But I think the the day to day work is is you know is very consistent, and I think serves the interests of Americans and, and workers around the world. So, so I don't know that I can speak exactly to kind of what the future holds in terms of the folks we we're hiring. I mean, I would expect it would be pretty similar to what we had in the past. Like I said, the people with international relations backgrounds. Uh, people with strong analytical skills, people with language skills, those those, those kind of folks are always going to be strong candidates. Yeah. And one question about the experience. Um, my brief look at the, the broad field of, of labor and human rights and child traffic, child labor and all that shows such a wide spectrum of approaches from organizations. You have really 
radical organizations and their approach to labor questions, and you have more conservative ones that are, are happy to see incremental change, yeah. work with corporations step by step, um, gently poke and prod rather than name and shame. Are there kinds of experiences that are more appealing as you review resumes? Do you want the people with the really dirty hands-on work who've seen it firsthand? Do you prefer people who've been part of the more gentle approach? Are there things that stand out positive or negative to you as you review candidates? It's a really good question. I, I don't think we go in with any preconceived notions about which of those is better, which of those is more appealing to us. I mean, I, the reality is, unless we're in a strict enforcement role, which we sometimes are, but most of the time, most of the time, you know, I kind of laid out the three, the three outcomes, you know, everything is fine. We're somewhere in the middle where we think we can support them making progress or we're basically going to take them to arbitration. Most of the time we're in that second category. So, so the, the tools that we need people to, to have the skills we need them to have really run the gamut. I mean, I think, you know, yes, we want people who are passionate and like have kind of the fire in their belly and believe in what we do and are, you know, gonna, gonna toe the line and, and, you know, be a serve when we need them to. Yes, we need people who also can be collaborative, who can, you know, when there's political will and, and an interest in actually doing the right thing, who are gonna help find solutions. Uh, yeah, we need people who kind of have supply chain skills and understand how business works and, you know, can, can kind of determine in situations where the private sector may actually be the, the, the entity most able to effectuate change in a particular context knows how to work with the private sector. Yeah, we want someone who, you know, can roll up their sleeves and, you know, is going to be out taking worker depositions in a sugarcane field at 11 p.m. I mean, all of the above. I, I think it just you know, that all of those people would have, would be in my kind of short list of, of folks that I would consider for the job. And uh, it just kind of depends on um, how their background, how their skills align with what we're looking for at a particular time. But I think all, all of those skills would be relevant. You know, I mean, we, we hire folks who have worked in corporate social responsibility, private sector role. We hire folks who have worked in international development organizations. We hire folks who have worked for kind of big picture, um, you know, international organizations like UN or ILO, I mean, it, it, it's all of them. And I think that the most successful folks here are the ones who I know I can send them into a negotiation with the government and they're going to be super diplomatic and, you know, kind of stick to their talking points and be strategic and smart and represent us well. And I also know I can send them into meet with workers organizations and they're going to be very sympathetic and kind of those people as well. So I think someone who can wear various hats and and pull different skill sets, those are the best people. You don't always, you know, there's not a ton of people out there who have super diverse backgrounds like that. So I think everything described be would be relevant background skills. And you know, we're we're also very committed to professional development once folks get here. Kind of as I mentioned before, it, it's a bit of a niche field. So we don't expect that someone is going to show up on our doorstep being like, yes, I have worked in international labor issues or international trade issues for the past 10 years. Usually there's some nexus to what we do in kind of an international relations, international affairs, trade, human rights type of way. But you people don't show up with the kind of full skill set on day one. So we're we're committed to kind of figuring out, okay, here's what you do really well. Here's where we think you can still grow. Here's the ways that we can support you in those in that growth. You know, here's how we can carve out some of your work, your work hours to focus on professional development or training. Here's the funds we have available to help you do that. So we do, you know, it's a case by case basis. We don't require folks to do this, but if there's an interest, we have a commitment to help our staff develop uh, individual development plans with our supervisors that will kind of set a path for the next two years on, you know, these are your professional goals. Here's where your supervisor thinks you could grow. Here are your thoughts on where you would like to grow. Here's kind of the nexus between the two, and here's how the office can help support you to, to do that. So um, it, it takes a lot. So it's a lot of different skills that folks pull on. But again, the assumption is no one shows up kind of fully baked on day one, and we we, we support people in their That's great. I have one last question. So if folks have anything else they'd like to learn or draw out from Josh, now's a good time. 
as I'm sure you know, Josh, many of our folks encounter students whose only understanding of the international affairs work in the U.S. government is the State Department. Yep. So what should our folks know about why labor and why iLab in particular as they meet with students? So I would say, you know, the Department of Labor's mission in general is about workers, right? It's about, it's about the individual people who are actually making the global economy function. Uh, it's, about, it's about the people who, who really drive the world. And so we, we are, I think more than any other agency, we are focused on individual help, you know, working to benefit and help individual people. Uh, I think we are, we're the part of the government that is focused specifically on workers. So everything we do in all of the offices I described is focused specifically on workers. That doesn't mean there's not other parts of the global economy and of the world that are they're not important, of course they are, but I think, you know, you can go to places, kind of massive bureaucracies at, you know, State Department or USAID or wherever that do great work, but you're kind of a small cog in a big machine uh, that is probably trying to do, you know, 40, 50, 60 different things. We have, we come at, you know, workers issues from different angles, but we're, we're exclusively focused on workers and we're small. We're about 120 people in all of ILAP. So that means you get a lot of responsibility. Now, there, there's no one that I can think of that we say, you know, show up, sit at your desk from nine to five, go home. I mean, like this job is about uh, getting out. I mean, I, I tell people, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you have reasons you can't travel, then we are, you know, this is an accommodating workplace. But if there's not any restrictions like that. We want you to be on the field. I want you to go, the countries you cover, I want you to go there. I want you to meet people. I want you to talk to workers. I want you to spend time sitting there understanding their issues. I want you to go talk to the employers as well, hear their perspective, talk to the foreign government, hear their perspective, you know, really develop expertise on these issues. Like, I alluded to this earlier. I mean, the goal of the office uh, is, is that our people are the leaders in the US government on international labor issues. So if something affects workers' rights, if something affects international labor issues, our folks have done the deep dive. Our folks understand the ins and outs. And when push comes to shove, the White House or the Hill or whoever is, is gonna come to us. And so I, I think this is the kind of place where if you want to, if you want responsibility, if you want to be able to actually get out in the field, uh, you know, if you want, you know, look, we're still the federal government, so we don't have people running around freelancing as far as I know, but, but there's, there's less, there's less bureaucracy than there is in other places. And, and if you want, you know, a mission that really fundamentally is about uh, workers' rights issues, then I think this is a great place to work. That's a wonderful way to close it out. Uh, so thank you very much, Josh. I'm at least revved up for these, <laughs> for these issues. All right. um, and hopefully uh, my colleagues who are on the line are able to transmit a fraction of your commitment and uh, enthusiasm for the work to their students as they look for opportunities. And hopefully you'll see many more APSIA interns and fellows and applications coming forward. Um, and you can see at least one of them is, is one of my colleagues is talking about your, your great passion as well. So thanks to you and thanks to everyone for joining us. And thanks again to the Robertson Foundation for the motivation to hear more from colleagues like Josh at federal agencies. I hope uh, all my APSIA colleagues will join us at future webinars to learn more about other great employers. Have a great day, everyone, and uh, hope it's dry wherever you are. <laughs>